The Morbid Curiosity Podcast continues to be sponsored by Audible.com. If you're busy like me, but you still want to read up on all sorts of morbid history or keep up with the latest science fiction and fantasy writers, Audible is the way to go. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to these audiobooks on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player while you work, cook, on your commute, or at the gym. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. I have some recommendations of books you can find on audible.com on the subject of today's episode, but I'll get to those later. For now, on with the episode. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. The Inca people of Peru are known for many things. Massive dry stone walls without mortar, built without machinery, that are fitted together so tightly you cannot fit a knife between their blocks. The remote mountain ruins of Machu Picchu and the extensive terraced farms that blanket the mountainsides of the Andes. These are all amazing feats for an ancient civilization. But one of the most well-known things that the Inca produced amongst those of us who are morbidly curious are ice mummies. In simple terms, a mummy is the deceased body of a human in which the skin has been preserved over the skeleton. Sometimes they are created artificially as part of a funeral ritual, like those of ancient Egypt. Other times they are made naturally, such as bog bodies or Otzi the Iceman the preserved body of an ancient traveler who froze to death as he crossed the Alps. The mummies of Egypt are created by the removal of the internal organs that cause putrefaction, or the breakdown of a deceased corpse, by priests who then dry the body in natron, rub oils on the skin, and finally entomb it in a hot and dry desert environment. Ice mummies, on the other hand, are made when ice crystals form in the tissues of the body while it cools to freezing. These ice crystals draw out water as they form, creating a desiccating or drying effect. This occurs especially at temperatures between 14 and 23 degrees Fahrenheit. During this process, 90% of the water in the body turns to ice, while the remaining 10% is prevented from doing so by its chemical bonds with the body's cellular compounds. If the cells, and therefore the person, is alive when they begin to freeze, the cells are more likely to survive this process intact. It's also likely at these temperatures that the body's normal process of decay will be slowed or even prevented, further assisting in preserving the soft tissues like skin and hair. The most famous of these Inca ice mummies is that of a young girl who was ritually sacrificed to the mountain gods on the mountain of Ampato in Peru. Her true name is unknown, but those who discovered her named her Juanita, the Ice Maiden. Before I tell you about her, I want to give you some background on the area she was found and the people who brought her to her final resting place. The Andes, or Andean Mountains, are the largest continental mountain range in the world. They lie all along the western coast of South America, passing through seven countries. The Andes are divided into three climate zones, tropical, dry, and wet, and are the highest mountain range outside of Asia. They are also home to the world's highest volcanoes, many of which are active. To the east lies the lush jungles of the Amazon, and to the west, along a small strip near the coast, is the Atacama Desert, the driest non-polar desert in the world. The climate of the Andes varies, 
and often changes drastically in rather short distances, with rainforests existing just miles away from snow-covered peaks. In effect, it's an amazingly rugged terrain, being both harsh and lush at the same time, all while at high altitude on the steep slopes of the mountains. It was in this environment that the Inca Empire bloomed. The Inca Empire dominated South America between the 13th century and 1572 CE. At its height, it was the largest ancient empire ever to exist in the Americas, having control of the entire Central Andes mountain range, an area that spans from northern Ecuador to central Chile. To put this into perspective, it spanned an area similar to the length between New York and Los Angeles. Archaeologists divide the history of the Inca into several periods, called horizons. These horizons are defined by the art styles that spread over a wide area of Peru for specific amounts of time. Between each of these horizons are intermediate periods, where no art style was particularly prominent. The Inca blossomed in the Late Horizon, between 1475 and 1535 CE, after developing from several other cultures over the centuries, including Chavin, Nazca, Moche, Tiahuanacu, Huari, and Chimu. Although the Inca built on the advances of these pre-existing cultures, they had many technological advances of their own. They developed one of the most extensive systems of roads through the high Andes mountains, rivaling those of the Roman Empire. They had way stations along these roads, shelters stocked with supplies for those that traveled across them. They developed the dry stone walls I mentioned before, made of huge carved stones that didn't require mortar. We still don't know how they achieved this feat of engineering. The Inca also managed to administrate a multi-ethnic state that incorporated many conquered groups of people and integrated them into a highly functioning economic, political, and religious system that used a single common language, Quechua. They expanded the terraced farming system that existed before them and created irrigation techniques to keep them productive year-round. This they did and more, all without written language or help of the wheel. Instead of writing, they used a system of knots on colored strings called a quipu to keep records. Instead of wheeled vehicles, they used caravans of llamas and alpacas that could travel over the rugged terrain of the Andes to transport goods and people. At the head of this culture was the emperor, who was believed to be the son of the sun god, Inti. He was the secular ruler and head of the Inca religion. He stayed in the capital of the Inca Empire, Cusco, in Peru. One of the most famous Inca emperors, usually just referred to as the Inca, was Pachacuti, who expanded the empire around 1438 CE. It was during his reign that Machu Picchu, the remote mountain citadel, was constructed. Pachacuti Inca's son, Topa Inca, who reigned sometime between 1463 and 1493, further expanded the empire, as did his son, Huayna Capac, who reigned from around 1493 to 1525. However, when Huayna Capac died, his sons fought over the throne, weakening the Inca Empire, just as the Spanish conquistadors arrived in search of gold. Zero immunity amongst the Inca people to European diseases, coupled with the rivalry between Huayna Capac's sons, meant that the Spanish were able to conquer a state that rivaled any in Europe in both size and riches. This is a fate that has befallen many a great empire that became internally divided. In terms of religion, the Inca people were polytheistic, meaning they worshipped many gods, but also took part in worship of the natural world. Most important of the Inca gods were Wiracocha, the creator of all things, Inti, the sun god, and patron of Cusco, and Pachamama, the earth goddess. However, to many of the common people, the mountains they lived on were what they worshipped. Down from the mountain came the water they needed to live and grow crops. And, as many of the mountains were volcanoes, they were and are still today a source of power and fear. It's possible that this mountain worship is the reason the Ice Maiden came to be. The Inca were recorded to practice human sacrifice. The Spanish writers who wrote of it in their chronicles noted that the practice was called Capacocha, 
and children were usually chosen as sacrifices. Children were used because they were believed to be the most pure of all humans. The purpose of these sacrifices was believed to be that the children would serve as messengers or representatives of the people to the gods. They were deified and worshipped with the gods they went to live with after their sacrifice. They were honored for all time, unlike the dead of the common people who were worshipped for only a few generations. Annual ceremonial offerings may have been made at the location of each kapakocha, but it was not often that more than one child was sacrificed at the same place. Many of these children were given to the Inca by local communities as tribute every year, but only a few sacrifices took place regularly. The children that were given as tribute lived a cloistered life in Cusco. Most of them were female, taken from home at a young age. They were housed in special buildings out of contact with the rest of the population. While they lived in this seclusion, they were taught to weave and brew maize beer, chicha, which was used in both religious and political processes. It was usually just after puberty that the young women were removed from these secluded houses and either given as second wives to nobles or sacrificed to the gods. Neither of these options is appealing to us in our modern society, but to the Inca, it was an honor to have one's child chosen for this purpose. It elevated the child and the family in society, but even more so, this process was believed to be necessary for keeping the varied and vast Inca Empire functioning and on the good side of their gods. In fact, child sacrifice can be found in many ancient civilizations, including Old Testament writings, but that's a huge topic for another episode. It was reported in the chronicles written by the Spanish that those chosen for sacrifice were paraded through Cusco with much celebration, including drinking chicha and chewing coca leaves, a plant native to South America that is known for its psychoactive alkaloid, cocaine. The cocaine content in the leaves is relatively low, but it was and is still used as a stimulant, similar to coffee by local peoples. Many times the chosen child went on a journey back to the area they had originally come from and was sacrificed nearby in order to appease the local mountain gods. This is possibly why Juanita the Ice Maiden was discovered near the summit of Ampato. Dr. John Reinhard and his climbing partner Miguel Zarate were on an expedition in 1995 in the Andes of southern Peru, specifically the mountain Ampato. They were searching for an Inca site that had been reported by another climber, a ritual platform or possibly a way station. As they searched the rugged terrain near the summit of the mountain, nearly 20,700 feet above sea level, Zarate spotted a tiny bundle poking up from the receding ice, which was melting due to a recent volcanic eruption of the nearby mountain Sabancaya. A small face poked out of the bundle and immediately they knew they had found one of the sacrificial children of the Inca. After a long and careful journey down the mountain and a bus trip to Arequipu, Reinhard and Zarate reached out to Catholic University, who agreed to keep the mummy safe and frozen while it was analyzed. The university had a large freezer to store it in, but this was a temporary solution as the environment of the freezer was not very similar to that of the mountain that had kept the body of the girl so well preserved for hundreds of years. If the environments were too different, the mummy would start to decay. It was then the mummy of the girl was named Juanita, a name that also belonged to one of the summits of the most sacred mountain in the area, Ausangate. Soon after, the National Geographic Society sponsored a second expedition to Empato to explore the area near where the Ice Maiden was found. While searching the mountainside, it was discovered that Juanita had fallen from a tomb on the summit of the mountain. Six stone circles were found below the summit, and in one of them, another frozen body, that of another young girl. With her were weaving tools, wooden utensils, and vessels, two offering bundles full of coca leaves, and a pair of tiny sandals. This mummy, having never been exposed to the elements, appeared to be in exquisite condition. It took three days to carefully and painstakingly pry her from the frozen ground. To everyone's surprise, a third burial was also uncovered. It contained the body of a young child, facing south just like the other mummies, 
but unlike the others, this body had been burned. The Inca don't typically burn their human sacrifices, and the pattern of charring on the young boy was strange, leaving only a small hole in a golden statue that came with the burial, but scorching the entire body of the child. It was later determined that this body had been struck by lightning, after it was placed on the high plateau. To the Inca, lightning represented the violent power of the mountain gods, who used it to kill those who offended them. If a person survived being struck, however, they were considered to be chosen to be a priest of those gods. Besides being struck by lightning, this mummy was also different because it was likely a male, judging by the grave goods in the tomb. It's possible the male and female mummies accompanied one another and were entombed at the same time. In 1515, Juan de Baranzos, one of the Spanish chroniclers, wrote what he had learned of human sacrifices at a ceremony in Cusco. He reported that young boys and girls were sacrificed in pairs, buried alive with many adornments, the kind that married couples would possess. If his observations are correct, and not colored by his own cultural interpretations of the items buried with the children, then they may have been ritually married before being sacrificed. As the six platforms at the site where these two mummies were excavated, no other tombs were uncovered. There were, however, plenty of Inca artifacts, such as llama figurines and spondylus shells. Spondylus shells, which were possibly more valuable than gold to the Inca, as they had to be traded for from across the Atacama, suggest rich offerings to Mama Cocha, the rain goddess and wife of Viracocha. Perhaps these sacrifices were placed here to persuade the gods to end a drought. A layer of ash at the bottom of all three tombs also suggests that the volcano had erupted just before these children were sacrificed. Hot falling ash would have ruined the water and killed the herds of the people who lived around the mountain. Placating the mountain would have been of utmost importance to them. Perhaps this is the reason for the dual sacrifice of ritually married children to the married gods Viracocha and Mamacocha. As the expedition continued, the tomb Juanita had fallen from was finally discovered on Ampato's summit. One side of it had collapsed, possibly due to global warming or another volcanic eruption heating the ground. A wooden box was found within that contained a statue made entirely of spondylus shells. Upon returning to Catholic University with the new mummies, analysis was undertaken on all three. Juanita was slowly and carefully defrosted with heated water-absorbent pads in order to remove her wrappings and see what else could be gleaned about this child that was chosen to be a messenger to the gods. As the ice melted, more about her was revealed. She wore a plum-colored dress, or aksu, with a belt around her waist and two large metal pins that fastened the fabric at her shoulders. Over this she wore a gray and white striped woolen shawl, and on her feet were soft sandals, or moccasins. She also wore a headcloth of brown and gold, an item only a higher status Inca woman would wear. Her clothing in general was of very high quality. Due to the fact that her face and head were exposed outside of the bundle, the degree of exposure was used to estimate that she likely fell from her collapsing tomb sometime between 1991 and 1995, most likely in the spring of 1994 or winter of 1995, as those were the times Sabankaya erupted, heating the ground enough to free her from the ice. It was also evident that her body had thawed and frozen again several times before she was found. Inside her shawl, Juanita carried a feathered bag full of coca leaves. Her headcloth had also been pinned down over her eyes, which indicated she was likely dead before she was entombed. This may explain the perceived regality of the position of her body. Reinhard described it as if she were serenely gazing out toward the mountain, having accepted her death. However, she was likely posed as such by the priests that conducted her sacrifice. Disturbingly, it was revealed when her hand was unwrapped that she held a death grip on a piece of cloth. It's very likely this was due to a cadaveric spasm, a rare form of muscular stiffening that occurs at the moment of death and persists into the period of rigor mortis, the stiffening of the entire body due to chemical changes after death. 
The cause of these spasms is unknown, but they're usually associated with violent deaths. After Juanita was unwrapped, she was also scanned using 2D and 3D CT scanners, which revealed a startling fact. Juanita had a blunt force trauma wound on the side of her head. It seems she was hit with a blunt weapon, likely some sort of club. Judging from the hematoma or mass of clotted blood around the wound that was visible on the scan, she was alive when she was struck just above her right eye. DNA testing was also done, and at the time it was determined that Juanita's closest ancestors came from Panama, but later tests using a wider set of comparison data showed her to be from the area where she was found. DNA was also used to determine the contents of her stomach at the time she died. It appeared she had eaten a small meal of vegetables six to eight hours before death. Radiocarbon dates were also calculated and showed that she was alive sometime between 1460 and 1532 CE. The layer of volcanic ash beneath her tomb further narrows this date to between 1460 and 1470. It's possible she was sacrificed not long after the Inca took over the area around Ampato, merely one generation before Columbus landed in the New World. Before Juanita's discovery, there was no physical evidence to show how the child sacrifices were actually dispatched. Chroniclers reported that the children were buried alive or suffocated, a type of death that does not leave long-lasting marks as evidence for archaeologists to prove such reports. However, one chronicler, Barnabé Cobo, who is known for being well-researched in his history of the Inca, wrote that the child sacrifices were often buried alive, strangled with a cord, or in some cases, clubbed to death before burial. With all of this evidence, a picture of Juanita's last moments can be starkly visualized. Likely prepared for this moment from a young age, she and possibly a retinue of priests climbed to the summit of Ampato stopping at way station platforms along the way to eat and rest. It's likely she was dazed from the high altitude, fatigued from the long journey, and sedated from the use of coca leaves. When they reached the summit, there was likely some sort of ritual performed, and then Juanita was hit on the side of the head with a club, and died quickly afterwards. She was then lowered into her final resting place, and sealed inside. There she stayed for hundreds of years, before another eruption dislodged her, and she went tumbling down the mountainside, where she was found by chance by an archaeologist and a mountain climber. The other two mummies were also analyzed. It was revealed that the girl was buried with the square red tunic of an adult male, which could be a symbolic offering from the child's father, or represent that her father may have been the leader of a conquered people, as they often wore red tunics. Her clothing in general was sized for an adult, which may have been worn to symbolize adulthood or her after-death marriage. She also wore a feathered cap, a high-status adornment, which stood out against her common clothing. Her mouth hung open and on further examination was found to show signs of carbonization. It was later determined that she too, like the boy, had been struck by lightning. It's unknown if they were placed on the platforms purposely to be struck by lightning, or if it was just chance, as lightning is likely to strike more often at those elevations. The boy's body was merely a skeleton, thanks to the lightning strike he suffered, and it was found that the girl's body beneath the wrappings was also skeletonized. Any attempt to unwrap her would disturb her position and possibly cause the mummy to fall apart, so she was left undisturbed. However, it was determined that neither the girl or the boy showed signs of skull fractures, so it has been suggested that perhaps they were strangled or suffocated. Not every researcher agrees that these children were sacrificed to the gods. One Spanish chronicler, Garcilaso de Vega, denied that any sacrifice occurred. He stated that the children died of natural causes and were then carried up the mountain. This single account is enough for some modern researchers to disregard the accounts of the other chroniclers. However, dozens of other chroniclers described these sacrifices, and the archaeology, the physical evidence left behind, supports that these children were indeed sacrificed. Archaeology even shows that after the Spanish conquered the Inca, 
These sacrifices were performed less and less, but didn't stop completely. They have even been reported in more modern times. You can read more about this in Patrick Tierney's book, The Highest Altar, The Story of Human Sacrifice. Juanita was displayed at the Smithsonian for several weeks after the CT scans were complete. Over 80,000 people visited her in her specially designed refrigerated display case. Even more people saw her on television. After this, she was also displayed in Arequipa, in the oldest church in the city. There, she was prayed to, and people made offerings to her, a similar form of worship to that of the Virgin Mary. This may seem strange to us, but treatment of the dead varies amongst all cultures. Many people believe that disturbing the dead is taboo, but in the Andes, display of the dead was more common throughout history. In fact, mummies of the ancestors were brought out and honored at major celebrations until fairly recently. These honored dead were important members of the community, and Juanita qualified as such. Therefore, the indigenous peoples were mostly in favor of her display. Juanita was named one of the 10 most important discoveries of 1995 by Time magazine. An article about her came out in National Geographic in June 1996. She made it to the Guinness Book of World Records in 1997. She was even one of Esquire magazine's Women We Love that same year, and even inspired an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and was referred to on an episode of Bones. With so much attention, not all the press surrounding Juanita was good. Conspiracy theories began to crop up, such as the idea that U.S. scientists were trying to use her DNA to create a new race. Some believed she was an angel of the second coming of Christ, Rumors began to spread that child sacrifice might make a comeback due to her popularity. It hasn't, but with each mummy that is discovered in the Andes, these same rumors tend to crop up. Many books were published about Juanita, and if you want an even more detailed account of her discovery, I recommend John Reinhardt's book, Ice Maiden, Inca Mummies, Mountain Gods, and Sacred Sites of the Andes. If you want more information on the Great Inca Empire, I'd recommend two books by Charles River editors. One is The World's Greatest Civilizations, The History and Culture of the Inca, and the other is The Mythology and Religion of the Inca, both of which you can find on audible.com. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, just for MCP listeners, audible.com is offering a free audiobook download and a 30-day trial. You can download these excellent books or any other audiobook from their massive collection to keep for free, whether or not you keep the service, by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. You're going to want to keep it, though, because there are so many awesome audiobooks on there. Once again, that's www.audibletrial.com mcp to get your free 30-day trial and free audiobook. Getting a free trial also supports the MCP, so I highly recommend it. Due to their popularity in modern media, references to ice mummies have also appeared in video games. One example is the original Tomb Raider, in which the main character Lara Croft searches Peruvian ruins for powerful magical artifacts. Andean mummies also feature in another Tomb Raider game, Tomb Raider Legend, in which Lara visits a ruin in Tiwanaku, Bolivia. In both games, mummy bundles are visible in several levels of the game, although Lara makes no comment about them, besides killing one at the end of the Tomb of Qualipec, the final stage of the Peru level in the original Tomb Raider. Can you tell I love Tomb Raider? Just an archaeology nerd's note, though. Through the archaeological artifacts depicted, mainly statues and carved motifs, the original Tomb Raider suggests that the ruins in Peru are from the Aztec culture, not the Inca. But the Aztecs did not have a presence outside Mesoamerica, making the game highly inaccurate. Despite its historical and anthropological shortcomings, both are still a great example of how archaeology can inspire modern media. Plus, they're just really fun games. For a culture as innovative as the Inca, to us, child sacrifice seems like a step back in time. What we don't understand in this modern age is that these sacrifices were viewed as necessary to keep the innovations they had functioning. What good are roads, irrigation systems, and walls if the mountain rivers dry up or the volcanoes coat the fields in ash? 
Can you blame them for thinking that these active volcanoes, these huge mountains that could provide or take away at the drop of a hat, were gods? The finding of Juanita was no doubt a special experience. First, we were able to peel back the layers of history to see exactly what the Inca were like when they were alive, with an acute focus on the moment when they felt their most vulnerable. But Juanita was also able to capture the interest of half the world, being that she seemed to be an almost miraculous find. Dr. Reinhard stated in his book that some Andean villagers from the area where Juanita was found believed that he and Zarate had been judged as worthy individuals, and therefore had been given the gift of the mummy by the mountain gods. Either way, the discovery of a young girl's mummified corpse changed the archaeological world forever, and brought out the curiosity of the wider public as well, a feat that in itself sometimes seems miraculous. This is because her life, death, and preservation sparks our own morbid curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Elena, Justine, Alan, Kay, Janet, Margie, and James for contacting us with episode suggestions. Thank you to Sacha, Jordan, Margie, and Craig for their discussion of the Winchester Mystery House on the MCP Facebook wall. And thank you to Michelle and Kaz for wishing me a happy Halloween after the Raven episode was released. I really enjoyed reading that, and I hope you all enjoyed listening. Thank you to T, Sergeant Thunderfist, Jeannie Thomas, Rodney, Dr. Keita, Timothy, Linda, Tomorrow, and Bone Palace Ballet for retweeting and talking about the MCP on Twitter. A huge thank you again to Dr. Kita for talking to us all about Slenderman. Also, thank you to Slinky for your review on iTunes. I read all of these and I'm really thankful for your kind words. A huge thank you to Kevin for his generous donation and message on the website. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks to you, the listeners. Our creepy community is growing. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows in the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you'd like to support the MCP, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. There you'll find a donation button, links to all our social media, and other ways to contact us. Your donations help us keep the podcast going, as well as signing up for a 30-day Audible trial. We get the support, and you get a free audiobook. It's a win-win situation, so head to www.audibletrial.com slash mcp and sign up to help us out. We really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.